Having gorged ourselves on bike tech and pinchers at the grand depart of the 2023 Tour de France, the Bike Radar team is now back home and digesting everything we learned. As always, there was lots to see and the archetypal Tour de France bike has evolved significantly since last year's start in Copenhagen, Denmark. From lightweight aero all-rounder bikes and one-by drivetrains to supersized tires and ultra-expensive parts, this year's Tour certainly has its own special flavour. And with that in mind, let's dive into six of the key tech trends dominating the peloton at the sport's biggest race. But before we go any further, I'd just like to say a big thanks to Design for sponsoring this part of the video. After a stunted start to life in the pro peloton, one by drivetrains for road bikes are back in the conversation. At the time of recording, we've seen two riders using one by SRAM Red ETAP Axis drivetrains so far at this year's tour. Do two riders make a trend though? Well, they do when it's last year's yellow and green jersey winners, Jonas Vingegaard and Wout van Aert. As for why these two are choosing to run one by instead of two by, well, it's hard to say. On the right parkours, it is possible to eke out a few marginal gains with a one by setup, such as improved chain line, marginally reduced aerodynamic drag, and of course, a simpler shifting setup with less risk of chain drops. On the other hand though, with only one chain ring available, riders do have to choose between having lots of gear range but large jumps between the gears, or less overall range and a tighter cassette, so there definitely are some compromises to it as well. Could it be pressure from team performance directors or sponsors? SRAM has, after all, pushed one by for road and gravel much more than Shimano, who sponsor the majority of the teams in the peloton. We don't know, of course, though we are sure that neither Jonas or Wout would run it on their bikes if they thought it was a significant disadvantage. Like the changes from rim to disc brakes, tubular to tubeless tyres and lightweight to aero bikes in recent years, pro riders can sometimes be cautious about tech innovations, so we don't expect the rest of the peloton to be jumping ship to one by any time soon. We can still be sure that other riders and teams will be paying attention though, and if Jumbo Visma does have success on one by, then we may see more of it at the Tour going forward. Just when we thought things were calming down in terms of tyre choice, we actually saw quite a wide variety of tyres and whips at this year's tour. As has been happening for a number of years, we're seeing an ever-increasing amount of tubeless wheels and tyres and far fewer tubular options. Interestingly though, it appears that teams simply haven't settled on 28C tubeless tyres across the board. Instead, each team we saw appears to have optimised its tyre setup for the specific bike and wheel combinations it has access to. For example, when we saw Jonas Vingegaard's Cervelo S5 at the Jumbo Visma Team Hotel, it was equipped with 24mm wide Vittoria Corsa Pro tubular tyres. Now that's obviously pretty narrow by modern standards, but given they were mounted to a set of reserved 34-37 wheels, I suspect this is a lightweight combination intended to help get his bike weight down as much as possible for the lumpy opening stages. I wouldn't be surprised if Jonas switched this wheel set out for something more aero, perhaps with tubeless tyres for the flatter or more rolling stages at this year's tour. Over at the UAE Team Emirates Hotel, Tade Bogacha's bike had Continental GP5000 TTTR tubeless tyres mounted on NV SES 4.5 wheels. Now, these were nominally a size 28C, but on the NV rims, which have a super wide 25mm internal rim width, these tyres actually measured up a whopping 31.3mm at the front and 32.2mm at the rear. Now, as with Jumbo Visma, we don't know if this is what today will run for every stage. You might switch over to lighter wheels and narrower, lighter tyres for the mountain stages, for example. But it is pretty wild to see tyres this wide being used for standard road stages at the Tour de France, and we suspect other teams will again be paying very close attention to how they get on. While we saw a smorgasbord of full-fat aero road bikes at last year's Grand Depart, this year was all about the lightweight aero all-rounders. Of course, that's perhaps unsurprising given this year's opening stages around Bilbao, Spain were significantly hillier than those around Copenhagen, Denmark, where last year's race started. The influx of a number of new, lightweight aero all-rounder bikes such as the new Factor 02 VAM, a new Ridley, a prototype BMC and the Look 795 Blade RS shows that many riders at the pointy end of the sport are still chasing those last few hundreds of grams. Of course, we all know, thanks to all your lovely comments, that almost everyone outside of the pro peloton also cares a lot about bike weight. So, is this just bike brands waking up to consumer demand? Well, possibly. Bike brands do exist to sell bikes after all. 
Part of me is also wondering if many brands are looking at the popularity and success of bikes such as the Specialized Tarmac SL7, arguably the archetypal lightweight aero all round the road bike from the last few years, and thinking that they'd like some of that success for themselves. In terms of how much bikes actually weighed at this year's tour, we saw a real range, from just over 6.9 kilos for Simon Clark's new Factor O2 VAM, all the way up to 7.94 kilos for Mathieu van der Poel's Canyon Air Road CFR. Interestingly though, looks were fairly deceiving in this department. Despite Pogaccia's Carnago V4 RS being adorned with an array of super expensive weight weenie parts, including carbon chain rings and those TT tires, it only weighed 100 grams less than Ben O'Connor's new prototype BMC Aero road bike. If you want to see how much every bike we saw at this year's tour weighed though, check out our other videos from this year's Grand Depart. We've put links to those in the video description below. Time trials typically see riders go all in on speed, with comfort and durability going out the window. Increasingly though, we're seeing some time trial specific kit being used in road stages of the Tour de France too. Aero helmets, skin suits and aero socks for example are now almost ubiquitous throughout the Tour peloton. Of course the main cost for using these instead of standard versions is just comfort, but how would you feel about risking more punctures for a marginal gain in rolling resistance? Interestingly, that's something a number of teams are doing by running time trial specific tyres for road stages. So far we've seen UAE, INEOS and Bahrain all using the Continental GP5000 TTTR for road stages and we also saw a Team Jayco Giant Propel set up with Vittoria Corsa Speed tyres too. Now it's notable that the riders and teams doing this seem to be the ones using tubeless wheels and tyres, and we suspect the fact that tubeless sealant can potentially help seal any untimely punctures is enabling some teams to take their chances. Of course, there's the reduced wear life of the thinner treads to contend with on these types of tyres too, but when you're not paying for your equipment and you have a small army of mechanics at your disposal, that's less of an issue. As most of us are aware, it doesn't really matter how aero your bike is if you don't adopt an aerodynamic riding position. With that in mind, most of the bikes we saw at this year's tour were fitted with long stems and narrow handlebars to help the riders get stretched out and lower their frontal area. Caleb Ewan, for example, had a Dada integrated handlebar on his Ridley with an enormous 14cm stem and a super narrow 36cm handlebar, perfect for helping the diminutive sprinter squeeze through tight spaces in the bunch. And while seeing the narrowest bars on the bikes of the smallest riders isn't a surprise, even taller riders are using skinny bars at the Tour these days too. Ben O'Connor, for example, is reportedly 1 meter and 88 centimeters tall, but he had a 36 centimeter wide handlebar on his prototype BMC aero bike. Even climbers such as Richard Carapaz and Jonas Vingegaard are now also using relatively narrow 38 centimeter handlebars. Presumably, they don't mind giving up a little bit of leverage for the potential aero gain. Now, the widest bars that we saw in Babel were just 40 centimeters wide on Mathieu van der Poel's Canyon Aero and Mark Cavendish's Villa Philante. Although, like many, Van der Poel turns his brake hoods in, which effectively gives him a narrower hand position. Of course, there may well be some riders in the bunch still on 42s or 44s, but it is certainly a dwindling number. There's no budget cap in professional cycling, and a race like the Tour de France can painfully expose the differences between teams even at the top level of the sport. Some UAE Team Emirates riders, for example, appear to have every piece of bling available. From those time trial specific tyres I mentioned, to envy wheels and components, weight weenie parts such as carbon tyre chain rings and brake rotors, and ultralight custom carbon seat posts. In contrast though, Peter Sagan and his Total Energies teammates are still running the previous generation Dura Ace Di2 R9100 group set and specialized turbo cotton clincher tires that were launched around 10 years ago. Of course, there's nothing wrong with 11 speed Dura Ace, just because there's something new available doesn't mean the old stuff is suddenly rubbish. And the turbo cotton tires are still regarded as some of the fastest clinchers ever made. However, it is hard to ignore the obvious disparities between one of the best funded teams in the peloton and one which perhaps isn't quite as flush with cash. Of course, you may be asking how much difference does any of this actually make? And that is a fair question. After all, it doesn't matter how posh your bike is, the rider still has to turn the pedals. But considering the margins between winning and losing can be so small at this level, the small differences can add up, especially over the course of a three week grand tour. Maybe it's time to introduce budget caps in cycling and level the playing field a bit. 
Those were our top tech trends for the 2023 Tour de France, but now we want to hear from you. Did we miss anything? What piece of bike tech do you think is going to be dominating headlines during this year's race? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and if you want to see more videos from the 2023 Tour de France, why not watch this one? Why didn't you go and see the video?